Well, good morning. I'm Mitch Stevenson. I'm uh, going to be the panel moderator for this panel on recruiting and retaining our future. Um, before we get started, I'd like to introduce the panel so you know who's up here talking with you. Our panel chair, when we find him, is uh, Lieutenant General Howard Bromberg, who is our 46th Army G1. And as you know, the G1 is responsible for all personnel policy and planning and the personnel budget for the Army. He's been serving our Army for 37 years and comes to the Army staff from Headquarters Forces Command, where he was the Deputy Commanding General. Uh, next is Major General Retired Galen Jackman, a 35-year veteran of our Army, an infantryman, a special operator, has held many key assignments, including command through the two-star level. He now works for Raytheon com the Raytheon Company, having joined them in 2008 and serves at the corporate level as Vice President for Army and Soft Programs. I'm glad Galen's on the panel because I know he'll provide some valuable insight from the commercial sector, which will no doubt be useful. Uh, next is Brigadier General Maria Gervai, Deputy Commanding General of the U.S. Army Cadet Command. She's a member of the Chemical Corps, a veteran of Operation Desert Storm, deployed to Turkey during Operation Iraqi Freedom as Chief of Operations for the 21st Theater Sustainment Command, uh, served as Chief of Staff to the Iraq Train and Advise Mission in May uh, of 2010 through June of 2011, as commanded at all levels of command as well. She holds an MA in Human Resources from Webster University and an MS in Strategic Studies from the Army War College. To her right is Bill Marriott, G1 Army Materiel Command. Bill is a member of the Senior Executive Service, a graduate of the Naval Academy, and served in the Navy for 26 years as a Naval Aviator. As AMC G1, he's responsible for staff super supervision and program management of civilian and military personnel management and administration, safety, employee res resiliency, and senior and executive service liaison. And last and best of all is Command Sergeant Major Dan Daly, Command Sergeant Major of TRADOC. He's a native of Palmerton, Pennsylvania, enlisted in the Army in 1989, attended basic training in AIT as an 11 Bravo infantryman. Sergeant Major Daly has served at every level of leadership from team leader through battalion, uh, brigade, division, and is currently, as I said, Command Sergeant Major of the U.S. Army Training and Doctrine Command. Sergeant Major Daly has five combat tours in support of Operation Iraqi Freedom and Operation Desert Shield and Storm, and has, along with uh, that, has attended every level of enlisted leadership training. He holds a Bachelor of Science degree, summa cum laude, from Excelsior University. So as you can see, we have a pretty terrific panel up here. I've asked them to keep their remarks down uh, to just about five uh, to seven minutes so that we have time for questions. Um, Mike will be passing out the cards as he does in, uh, usually at these panels, and so I'd ask you not to be bashful. Hit us with the hard questions um, so that we can uh, make this uh, most meaningful to you. Um, but I'm going to get us started, first of all, by just sort of picking up on what General Sullivan just said. Um, he talked about, and, in, and yesterday you heard Keith Walker talk about the reclining, uh, declining recruiting base. So if you'd show the next chart, please. When I became uh, the, uh, the commandant of the Ordnance School back in the year 2000, which is now 14 years ago, John Van Alstein flew up from Tradoc and, and briefed me on my new job. And one of the things he showed me was this chart. This data is now 14 years old. And on the left side of the chart, you see men. On the right side, you see women. And we've broken them down. These are all our recruiting population. And we've broken them down into, into various categories with regard to how valuable they are to the Army in terms of recruiting. And I won't take you around the whole chart, but if you'll just focus on the green slice where the arrows are pointing, both on the side with men, men and the side with women, you can see that the most desirable of our potential recruits is not a very big number of the total pool. And of course, not only are we after that pool, but so is the Air Force and the Navy and the Marine Corps and every other commercial and civilian uh, job um, hiring activity uh, who's trying to get these folks. So it, it isn't much that we have uh, out there that we can choose from to be the best of the best. And then I would last leave you with the point, how many of you think this green slice of the pie has gotten bigger over the last 14 years? It's probably not gotten bigger. In fact, it's in fact gotten smaller. But with that as a lead-in, and uh, I'd like to now turn the floor over to 
Howard, who's just. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was here. This is like just in time logistics. <laughs> just in time. Just in Our G1, Howard Bromberg. Hey, good morning, and thank you. And I was here, I was in the back, but I just. So uh, thanks for the opportunity to come down here today. And, uh, you know, it's kind of interesting because I spent the last two days, day and a half, with the recruiters in, um, down in Montgomery and here in the Huntsville area talking to recruiters about the challenge of recruiting. And, and I don't want to focus so much on their challenges other than the great work that our soldiers are doing out there. But this is really about when we look at talent for the future, and you look at both civilian talent and military talent and talent in America, what we see from the for, from the G1 perspective, is a constant change in the, in the, I won't say the labor market, but a constant change in the market of the human capital across, not just this nation, but across the world. So one of the questions I had from the recruiters yesterday I thought was quite insightful was, you know, we have uh, a rise in Hispanics in our nation and in our recruiting market, but yet all our tests are in English. Should we consider giving tests in Spanish to capture that talent where people don't have English as a primary language and then work on training those to speak English as a second language. Now, I just put that out there for a different way of looking at the problem that we face because this is about talent for the future. And the same thing when I was talking to the great civilians at Army Material Command yesterday, how do you bring in young, talented civilians into the, into the, into the market out of the greatest institutions within America? What are the different things we need to do? Are all our, are all our skills that we historically have gone for are the same type of skills that we want uh, for the future. What about our testing and how we look at people? Are our tests that we use the right kind of tests? Maybe we need personality-based tests. So we just need to start looking at different things across the nation. The other thing we, I think we, the people fail to look at is, the, is, the, is when we look to the future, it's very, very difficult to think um, what are exactly every single talent you need. You need certain intelligence levels, you need certain physical levels, and then you need certain levels of resiliency. And I know you're familiar with the Army's Ready and Resilient Campaign Plan, but for example, you may not be aware that we've been running tests inside of, for the last three years, we've been running tests inside of the Recruiting Command to look at personality-based testing. And we use that in a combination with other tests that we use. And what we found, for example, with people with GED equivalency, some of them have a much higher resiliency factor. They didn't finish high school. Maybe they were homeless for three years uh, between the ages of 10 and 16, but their resiliency is so much higher. They don't have a normal degree, but they complete basic training and they complete follow-on military training in their first three years of service at a higher rate than a standard high school graduate, even who has higher grades and higher ASVAS scores. So maybe we need to start looking at different things. And then the other comment I give you is that as we look at uh, with the work that TRADOC's doing on, on increasing roles of women in the military. That's what you hear about. Are we gonna open up uh, different MOSs and skill sets that haven't been traditionally opened before to women? It's, it's, it's about that, but what the bigger concept is, and I think if, this is what you have to think about, you have to step back from it and say, the bigger concept is we're getting the best talent that the nation has to offer in every one of our skill sets. Don't think of this of, oh my God, uh, we're gonna open up uh, you know, infantry or ranger school or something to females, what we should be thinking about, do you have the best talent that the nation has to offer for the Army of the future? Because we can't really see with what technology is going to bring and what the capabilities and the things that the nation is going to ask us to do, we can't really see exactly how that's going to fit together. Look how much we've changed in the last 30 years. If we don't grab this talent now and move it to the future, then we are going to be far worse off because as as uh, Mitch laid out earlier, you can see what the shrinking demographic pool is for the United States and the quality pool. So this is about talent, and I think we're going to have to expand ourselves even outside the U.S. market. So I want to stop right there. There's plenty of other things we can talk about as the panel goes through, but I with the, want to make sure we have adequate time for questions. So I think that's the that's the more important part of the engagement. So thank thanks, you. Howard. Galen. So what I thought I'd do is just uh, draw some quick comparisons between. Um, uh, you know, what I experienced uh, in uniform with uh, what I've experienced out here in uh, industry. Um, so I, I think uh, there, there's probably three things that I'd like to highlight. The, the first is uh, talent development in industry uh, tends to be much more nonlinear uh, than it does in the military. So it, you'll often find that uh, young people in industry uh, will often uh, 
get accelerated uh, much quicker into higher levels of, uh, of responsibility. Uh, the second uh, point that I would make is that in industry, if we have a gap at the mid and executive levels that we can't fill from within our own uh, uh, talent pools, uh, we'll go to the market and we'll find that talent and bring it into the organization. And I know that oftentimes uh, this has kind of been dismissed in the military out of hand, uh, but it's something uh, that that I think would be worth uh, considering, that there, there may be positions uh, and requirements at those levels uh, that you can find in the marketplace uh, out there. It's a new paradigm, uh, but certainly if you're looking for uh, certain types of innovation, out-of-box thinking, uh, those types of things, you, you may find it beneficial to go out there uh, in, into the marketplace. Uh, the third point that I would make, and I think that this was really highlighted uh, in Deborah's presentation uh, this morning, that uh, our, f our future talent pools uh, are going to require us to make some strategic investments in our youngest generation. And when, when I talk about our youngest generation, I'm talking about at the, at the uh, grade school and intermediate levels. Um, You know, what we have, what we have found is, is our business strategy, our long-term business strategy drives our, our talent strategies uh, out there. And let me give you just a couple of examples of that. Uh, so uh, for the last 10 years, we have had a focused effort in growing our international business. And that drives uh, our alchemy of uh, uh, diversity uh, in, our, in our company. Uh, and so we've had a uh, targeted program in finding uh, the right uh, people that can effectively uh, work out there on a, on a global basis. Uh, you know, our, uh, our uh, uh, vice, senior vice president of uh, human relations uh, is, is fond of saying, you know, had, had Custer paid more attention to diversity, the outcome at the Little Bighorn may have been different. Um, <laughs> Uh, another example uh, is that, uh, you know, we've paid a lot of attention to uh, systems integration uh, in, our, in our company, and we found that we, we had a, uh, a real shortage of systems architects. And so over the last three years, we have uh, increased by 20-fold the number of system architects uh, that we needed uh, inside our, our company. And oftentimes, we had to go to the marketplace uh, to get those, uh, those types of uh, talents. Um, we have 63,000 employees in, uh, in Raytheon, uh, 30,000 of them are engineers. Uh, we have found that in the engineering schools, the number of uh, women engineers that have been uh, graduated has declined from 21% to 16%. We've also found that if you're going to, like Deborah said, if you're really going to plant the seeds and attract uh, interest in science, technology, engineering, uh, and math, you have to really start uh, at, the, at the middle school level. So we have a number of programs that we work at the middle school level in the communities in which uh, we, we have a footprint uh, with programs like uh, Math Moves You, et cetera, to try to get uh, our uh, young, uh, girls uh, interested in uh, science, technology, uh, engineering, and uh, math. Uh, the last point that I, I want to make uh, is that um, much like the military uh, in the development of uh, our talent out there, we, we focus about 70% on the kind of experiential side, about 10% on informal and formal uh, training or education, and about 20% on the mentorship, the coaching and mentorship. And we think that uh, the best way to accelerate talent uh, inside the company is by leveraging mentoring and coaching. And that requires the commitment at the executive and mid-level uh, of, of those leaders uh, to be able to spend time uh, with the younger folks uh, and bring them along and, and to help, help accelerate them uh, in, the, uh, in the company. So I'll, uh, I'll leave it at that. Thanks, uh, Maria.
Good morning. Um, before I begin, I'd like to thank AUSA and Lieutenant General Stevenson and Lieutenant General Bromberg for allowing me to participate on this panel. Um, we at Cadet Command, we feel we play a very vital role in recruitment and retention of our talent for our Army. Uh, see, we commission about 78 percent of the officer requirements for the Army. So it's a role that we don't take uh, lightly, and we are always analyzing our program and how it should change. So I will tell you, I'm very honored to be able to talk to you today and be able to discuss some of the key changes that are taking place and what is driving those changes. If I can have the next slide, please. So what I'd like to do is just spend a little bit of time talking in three areas, recruitment, leader development, and some transformational changes that are taking place based on what we're seeing in the current environment and also the future environment. Now, I will tell you, we are extremely proud of the officers that we have produced um, throughout the years through the ROTC program. These officers have performed superbly. They have proven themselves in combat over the last 12 years. But look, quite frankly, the ROTC program has not changed in 30 years, despite the fact that the challenges of today and what we see in the future are much more different than the Cold War era. Our curriculum and our leader develop development model hasn't changed since the late 1980s. I will submit to you that the things that we did as we came through the program are the very things that we are doing today. So it is time to change based on what we're seeing in the environment and based on what we think we will see in the future battlefield. Our footprint is very similar to the one that existed during the Vietnam era. Now, on the recruitment line of effort, I will tell you that it's not about not meeting our goal. We are meeting our objective and our mission that has been given to us. However, where we're not doing as well is we're not doing very well in diversity, and that is in diversity of thought, ethnicity, and also meeting some of the academic disciplines that our Army needs, not just today, but in the future. Things like science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and also the up and coming cyber field, the health field. So we have to do a much better job with that. We're also seeing clearly our market analysis and our diversity analysis that we've done has clearly shown us that we are overrepresented in some areas of the country and we are very underrepresented in other areas of the country. Areas such as uh, New York City, in uh, sh Chicago, in Los Angeles. And we have very low market penetration in areas such as Texas uh, and Arizona. And these are some of the areas where we see in the future, um, we see the increases in some of those d academic disciplines that we need and also um, the Hispanic population. So we have clearly taken a look at our program and we've kind of changed the way that we are, are recruiting. We are increasing our presence in certain markets. We have just opened two programs in the college um, in New York City and also in Chicago. We are also doing precision recruiting um, and we're using our scholarships incentive to get after things like the science, technology, and engineering, mathematics, STEM, getting after some of the, uh, the cyber, the communications, those degrees that our future Army will need. Because just as we are starting to enlist those soldiers that are very comfortable with m the more technological degrees, um, we also need officers who are able to do that. So our recruitment effort is focused on getting in the right markets um, and making sure that we're recruiting the right academic disciplines. And in order to do that, we're going to have to change our footprint. And we are currently doing that. And I'll draw your attention to the, the last line of effort, the transformational line of effort, because we are currently doing an analysis on all of our 275 host university programs that we have out there right now to determine, you know, are they meeting the criteria? Are they providing the right requirements for the Army? And we're doing an assessment on that right now. And because of the, we know that our resources are going to go down. We know that our force structure is going to go down. And we're going to potentially have fewer officer requirements. That is going to drive us to have to maximize our resources in order to ensure that we are providing the right capability to the Army. So those are two areas that we're very focused on. But the one that we have changed the most is the line of effort in the middle. And that is our leader development model. This is the program where we have focused on the curriculum and our summer training program. As we took a look at our, our curriculum, I will tell you that we were clearly out of balance in our curriculum. Our on-campus instruction was clearly focused on tactics. 
and less on officership values and ethics and teaching our officers those things that would be necessary to be effective, more effective as a platoon leader when in their first unit of assignment. So as we took a look at that, we found that it was task conditions based, it was more focused on throughput, and it was teaching them, you know, what to think, not how to think. So we have overhauled our curriculum and we have reduced the amount of tactical training taking place on the um, on campus and we've changed our summer training program. We now have consolidated all summer training programs at Fort Knox and that will start the summer of 2014. We are also moving to a cadet initial entry training. So think of a basic combat training for cadets. They will go to this their freshman and sophomore year and this will focus on basic soldiering skill at the squad, uh, at the squad level. I kind of thought it looked like space camp there for a while because those were some things that we were doing completely for total immersion. But at the same time, we are also changing our leader development assessment course and we're gonna focus that course on a more at the platoon level. But by consolidating at Fort Knox, what we're able to do is to provide better leader development opportunities throughout and a cadet's entire development cycle before their commission. And we think that is gonna pay, uh, better prepare our officers for the future. Now, uh, my final point, if you'll go to the last slide, I think what we have is we have a great opportunity to increase our partnership with, um, with industry here because what we're gonna see right now, our cadets, as they're commissioned, they enjoy about 60 to 70% right now enjoy a uh, active duty commission. As we go, move into the future, we think that number is going to go down. So what we have to do is a better job of preparing a cadet throughout their entire ROTC experience for potentially a, a uh, civilian uh, job and also to serve as an Army National Guard or USAR officer. And through that, I think we have great opportunity to ensure that through that preparation, we're allowing them to have internships and partnerships with industry that will develop them for the time when they are commissioned and have to um, be, become an officer and also have a civilian career. So with that, I look forward to taking your questions and I'll turn it over. Thanks, Maria. Bill? Sir, thank you. I'd also like to uh, echo the thanks to General Sullivan, AUSA, and yourself for moderating this panel and the other panel members. I'm honored to be up here representing the, uh, not only the 60,000 Department of the Army civilians for AMC, but the 250,000 overall Army civilians uh, AMC has about 25% of all Department of Army civilians, so uh, we are uh, we're honored to be able to represent them here today. Uh, many of you have seen the Chief of Staff of the Army's new Waypoint 2 that came out last night or, or this morning, depending on when you received it. One of his top priorities, of course, is to develop adaptive Army leaders, both civilians and, and soldiers. Uh, nested within that is one of General Vi's top five priorities, which is to cultivate a trained and ready workforce, which of course includes retaining the right people, recruiting the right people. Those things tend to get masked in a time of sequestration, uh, where in the recruiting aspect, last year the Army lost 20,000 more people than we brought in, and we still brought in 11,000 people. Uh, in the retention side, where we're paying people to get out, uh, but we still have to keep in mind that in the future, eventually we'll come out of the sequestration dip that we're in and be able to, and we need to be poised to, to make sure we have the right workforce with the right skills in the right places. To do that, I'd like to start off with what I saw as a as, as success in, in this effort and a vision for the future. Um, and then I'll work a little bit backwards. In my vision, and this is, this is mine, worked with some partners in the building and worked with uh, some of our staff, we'd have a much more agile civilian workforce than we have right now. We have old antiquated processes, which basically when you hire a civilian, and I, I know that the HR rules are such that there is some probation periods and condi conditional, career conditional periods, but I, I would like to see an opportunity to bring on a civilian like we bring on a soldier as a temp or a term for a long period of time, say up to eight years, that would uh, allow us to surge as we need to, to both up and down, uh, to meet the workload that we need. Along those lines, in my vision anyway, it would be a manage, to manage the civilians to budget type of effort. Along with Bobby Terzak, who's in the, the back row of the front here, our G8, and along with the building, we're working those kind of concepts now uh, to get through the artificiality of TDAs, especially on the reimbursable side, where TDAs, based on concept plans that are 10 years old, really don't match the reimbursable workload that our industrial base and RDECOM 
has at, at this moment. So all this is about building flexibility into our workforce so they have a more, more uh, we have more manageable and agile workforce. And ultimately, it minimizes the rifts, which are terrible on all, all sides. Um, and so if we have temps and terms that we could uh, allow to work themselves into career positions based on their performance after so many years, that's, I think, a more reasonable approach. It's the same thing we do with our civilians, uh, excuse me, our soldiers. Soldiers come in, uh, and they are allowed to re-enlist based on performance, based on the needs of the Army, based on the budgets, et cetera. Um, I'd also like to see a more HRC-like, probably on a virtual scale, uh, management of civilian careers. Right now, we have 31 career programs as a result of the civilian workforce transformation effort. Uh, about two years ago, only 40% of our civilians were in a career program. Uh, right now, they're all in career programs, but they're 31 stovepipe areas that frankly, frankly don't allow us the flexibility to move folks from one career program to another. So we'd have to start with multifunctional position descriptions. Again, working towards that agile workforce, working towards no more rifts if we can get to that point. And so the 31 career programs in this vision would be grouped into career fields that folks in career programs could move back and forth based on their desires, based on workload availability, based on the needs of the Army. And this is ultimately based on competencies, where there's ongo several ongoing competency efforts right now to put the right people in the right place. So how do we get to some of these points? I've taken an approach of three focus areas, the first being a responsible reshaping of the Army. This is my number one priority, as it is the closest wolf to the sled, frankly. As we go through sequestration, as we go through reductions, we need to make sure we've got the right people in the right places balanced throughout our, our Army. And so we need, we need to ensure that, uh, that we can try to do that. It's very, very difficult to responsibly take care of people. In some areas, we have too many folks, not enough in others. We need to find ways that we can move those folks in a responsible manner. The same thing goes for our soldiers, frankly. Even though I'm up here representing the civilians, uh, we like to see programs like the Soldier for Life program that DAG1 is responsible for that takes a soldier, whether they make it a full career or not, and, and says, you're one of ours, and we're going to take care of you, we're going to help you transition, we're going to try to help you get a job, and uh, you are a soldier when you're a soldier coming in, you're a soldier uh, for life. The second focus priority is workforce development. The number one cause of people leaving an organization is that they don't care for their supervisor, and supervisors aren't trained. One of my top challenges is in a sequestration environment, how do we develop our leadership? How do we develop our supervisors? Currently, right now, the only Army-wide leader development program is CES. And there are a lot of other homegrown programs out there, and that's by necessity. Uh, but the Army-wide program of CES doesn't touch everybody. Those folks that go through Leavenworth uh, gets about 300 people a year. When you're talking 260,000 Army civilians, you'll never, you'll never get there. Uh, we're com we have a commitment to, uh, that mobile training teams will be allowed, they'll come, we'll maximize those, of course. We've got to find other ways to deliver training, especially to supervisors, in a leadership way. Professional training is another, uh, another area we need to focus on, and most of those uh, are, again, homegrown based on the needs of the, of the local command. Um, we have high hopes with CES2, the next phase of, of civilian education system that uh, a lot of these questions will be answered. There'll be more throughput, more opportunities to develop our leaders. But again, that requires funding, and, and I know that's very difficult at this time. And last, and um, probably would be my top, my top focus area if we were not living in sequestration times, is, is how do we build a ready and resilient workforce? Uh, soldiers, civilians, we have the Ready and Resilient Campaign led by DAG1 that is a great effort to consolidate all existing programs. Speaking for the civilian side, many civilians don't have access to those programs, unfortunately. So again, we have to go to the homegrown route. And uh, so we'll continue to push for those because ready and resiliency uh, will take us to the, the place we need to be in the Army. It, it reduces stress, it reduces anxiety, it reduces uh, many of the, the difficult issues that, that we're facing. It puts us all on the same page, along with the Army Profession Initiative. Uh, again, that's that's been focused on soldiers, but for civilians is extremely important as well. Um, the civilians certification that comes with Army profession, uh, those opportunities to, uh, to more professionalize our, uh, our civilian corps as we have with the military, 
uh, puts us all on the same page, and in the end, uh, will lead to an adaptive force, uh, the right force of the right size, um, that's supported by the budgets that we have at the time. I'll stop there, and we'll, we'll wait for any questions and turn over to Sergeant Major. Thanks, Bill. We've got several. But before we start, Sergeant Major Daly. Good. Well, I first want to echo the comments of the fellow panel members and just send thanks to AUSA and General Sullivan for having us here today. And uh, just uh, very humbling to be up here with uh, such a great group of panel members. You know, uh, being a Sergeant Major on a panel has its ups and downs. <clears throat> Obviously, its down is that you get to speak last. But its up is that since the fact you're a Sergeant Major, you don't have to abide by time standards. So I'm going to go on for a few hours here. I'm not. I'm, we'll, we'll get to your questions very shortly. But I, I do want to give you uh, the soldier's perspective on our topic today of recruiting uh, and retaining our future. And, uh, and just uh, basically four points. First one being that um, future demands for talented human capital will present significant challenges, as it has in the past, but even more so in the future. The expectation of the American soldier is so high today compared to previous years. Um, because of what we expect of that soldier on that battlefield and the knowledge, skills, and attributes associated with what they have to do. As we witnessed in recent conflicts, increased demands and the scrutiny that are over our soldiers as they're on that battlefield every day require high intelligence, cultural astuteness, um, and extremely adaptable, and most of all, they have to be well-disciplined, and uh, the qualities of moral and ethical correctness um, are required to prevent the strategic private from occurring, as uh, we have saw has occurred in our conflict most recently, and unfortunately has occurred too often. But these demands will continue to decrease. As you, uh, if you, if you heard General Cohn speak yesterday on strategic land power, uh, we're about to get into some of the most complex operations that this uh, nation has ever had to face. Um, and really, it takes a national effort to get at some of the problems that General Sullivan um, introduced when he first uh, got up to, to introduce this panel, and some of the things that um, Dr. Barnhart touched on as well. My uh, fellow panel member put up a slide there that he said it was about 14 years old. But I'll try to give you a perspective on where we are today with regards to, our, to uh, the population that we target for, to, uh, to be our soldiers. In 2011, the census put us at about 33 million um, 17 to 24 year old young men and women across our nation. Uh, and we struggle with the challenges associated with increasing that number um, of those who are eligible to serve this nation. And not just, our, not just in a military sense, but this is a concern as a nation as a whole. Over 40% are ineligible due to medical conditions, criminal history, um, or having too many dependents. Another 20% due to the lack of education credentialing or their inability to meet uh, academic standards uh, required by our military. And then finally, um, for over 14 percent exceed body fat standards, uh, which uh, you know is contributing to high um, health costs in the United States. And this leaves roughly one in four. Um, that number used to be a little bit higher in, in, uh, in past years, but one in four Americans today in the ages of 17 to 24 years of eligibility uh, are eligible for service in any one of our um, services in the military. And as uh, General Sullivan mentioned, we're all in competition for this same great um, America's uh, youth. Um, that's academia, industry, as well as the other services. And as the, uh, as the demand increases, we're seeing a trend that the, uh, the population of those eligible individuals decreases. But Dr. Barnhart mentioned a few good points. There's, 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 it takes a national effort to, re to correct this path. And it's very simplistic things. Things that, when we were children, were very important in our schools. It's very simple things like presidential fitness campaigns. When I go around to basic trainings and AITs today, I ask young men and women, I said, you know, what did you, what did you do for athletics in high school? And unfortunately, some of them tell me that it wasn't a requirement in their school anymore. And then I'll ask them, did you try out for the presidential fitness campaign? And young men and women today don't even know what that is. And it's a little disheartening, I mean, because it's a significant challenge that we have at our youth today, but those are little things that we can ask our national leaders to help us enforce and our state leadership to re-mandate within our school districts. Science and technology is key to the success of this nation in the future, but we have to have a healthy youth uh, to be able to execute those missions that we require of them for both the civilian uh, workforce and our military. 
But the good news, and I'm going to share some good news with you, is that although the competition for the eligible qualified young men, when, men and women is very high, um, and the decreased propensity to serve is, con is historically consistent with the, uh, the growth of the, uh, the upward economic trend in America, I can assure you that our recruiting force is doing a phenomenal job. They met all the requirements in the past 12 years to meet the surges required of, the na of our nation in order to put uh, a large amount of uh, individuals in a short amount of time into our, in our service. And despite the fact for the past several years that our generation generating force has been uh, had to give up uh, both personnel and resources to our operating force, um, they've met each one of those goals with complete success. The soldiers that we are bringing in today, uh, as someone mentioned earlier, are the best soldiers that this nation can provide. I can assure you that. Um, and uh, not just by saying it, but uh, in our basic trainings in AITs, um, our historical uh, um, attrition rates prove it. So we're roughly 8 to 10% tw to is where we'd like to be. Um, we'll see an, a rise in those when we bring in a less qualified soldier, but we're back to historical attrition rates that we're comfortable with. The chain of command is also a key indicator. Um, and over the past two years, we've seen some of the most qualified soldiers uh, enter into our service. Um, at all-time high for academic rates, an average right now is 12.3 years of education, and the chain of command at the first du duty station reports that the, the quality of soldiers we're getting uh, due to the extremely low number of waivers that uh, recruiting command is issuing is phenomenal. But more importantly, what are we doing? We spend a lot of money, an average of $77,000 to recruit and train our soldiers through basic training in AIT. But what are we going to do to retain them in the future? Well, I can assure you that the efforts are ongoing. The Chief of Staff of the Army's uh, number one priority is the human dimension. And it is uh, developing our leaders and our soldiers to be better for the future. But I can assure you we're doing a lot more. From an enlisted perspective, we're in the midst of uh, the first comprehensive look of our non-commissioned officer education and training system um, since its inception in the early 70s. We're partnering with our state, federal, and local governments to establish agreements um, to give uh, credit to MOSs that have not done in the past, that, it, that it will equate to state certifications and licensing, something that uh, is gonna be, has a lot of work to be done in the future, but is critical to the success of our soldiers in ensuring that they get credit for the things that they do while they're on active duty. We're in the middle of a comprehensive overhaul of enlisted education and training programs. Um, we're working with academia to raise academic standards within our non-commissioned officer education and training systems to give them the eligible credit they, uh, they truly deserve for the work that they've done um, and uh, equate that to college credits. And then we're stimulating our uh, soldiers' minds by uh, doing creative things like delivering education and training through um, digital means, something that our soldiers today are more apt to, uh, to, to want to do. And I'll tell you, and, and they, are, they are grabbing on very fast to it. And lastly, we're educating our leadership to make sure that we're maintaining our soldiers on equality-based standards, telling our leaders to identify soldiers as we enter into a depleting resources and a smaller uh, um, generating force um, and also a, a small total force, we're asking our uh, leadership to make sure that quality and standards is the key they use to maintain um, our population. Depending on your questions, sir, that's all. Thanks, Sergeant Major. We've uh, got several questions that we've received already. Keep them coming. We'll keep uh, trying to answer them until we run out of time. I'd like to make a pass down the table, uh, starting with General Bromberg. Each panel member take a question and uh, provide your answer. Uh, thank you. The, the first question is, uh, given the Army is reducing by approximately 20 percent of our active duty force, uh, does it make sense that the Army uh, Bolex AMC should also reduce civilian workforce by 20 percent, and what is the plan to reduce the civilian workforce? Let me let me just kind of frame it, and then and then talk about uh, some civilian transformation options here. Um, the, the challenge we have right now, if you look at the budget, I don't think people really fully grasp this. I know General Barkley is going to talk later. Is is the money in the out years is gone already? It's physically not there. So so. So you have to go into the budget, first of all, and just say, where is the money? And it's just physically gone. So you have to make some decisions when the money's not there. The second piece of that is that when we try to balance this Army for the future between force structure, readiness, and modernization, the classic dilemma that everybody chat talks about, we have to balance it in an environment of increasing personnel, both military and civilian costs of the future. I know you've heard other people talk about that. 
what we don't have a tool for, and this is why we want to go to this budget-based approach that, that uh, we're really pushing very, very hard. We don't have a tool that equates uh, one soldier equals X civilians, one soldier equals X contractors. We, don't, we haven't built the Army like that. And so, yes, civilians are going to have to be reduced commensurate with the budget, but it has to be done in a smart way, which is part of civilian workforce transformation, part of the work that General Vi is leading down here, is to think of this differently. How do you shape the civilian workforce for the future? We have to change some things. And, I've, and I, I, I believe very strongly that you have to go to a budget-based approach, particularly in the, in the parts of the Army civilian workforce that can be tied to metrics and can be tied to output and can be tied to work, to workloading. It's harder on the staffs, but all the staffs have got to get smaller as well. Y y we're going to run into a challenge here with compensation and force structure modernization. If we don't get this balance right, it's, it's going to make us unprepared for the future. That, that's the biggest thing that we've got to face. And if you look at this, if you look at our budget, if you figure we might spend, let's just say you might spend 50 something billion on, out of 120 billion, uh, military personnel, you're going to spend over $22 billion on civilian pay. If you add on contracts, which includes contractor logistic support and includes other types of fee-for-service contracts, you've got another large $20 billion or so number. Don't quote me on the numbers, because, but I'm trying to make the point of that you qu quickly subsume the majority of your bu budget paying payroll. And I don't pay all the payroll in the Army, but if I were to approach it from a payroll standpoint, I would have to find different ways to spend our precious resource. Because as you go out to first platoon of Bravo Company, I don't want 40 soldiers standing there with no ammunition to put down range. That's not what we're about. That's the challenge we have right now. So is it a direct percentage? No, it shouldn't be a direct percentage. But it's going to have to be something different than what we've done in the past. And we have a system that you know is very, very inflexible. So. What we've done uh, in my last comment is we've gone to a hiring freeze for the last couple of years, and we've lost 22,000 civilians last year. The workforce across the Army had increased by 22,000. Um, and now what we're doing is we're saying, okay, let's go to budget-based approach, give you your money, and let you manage it at the local level. But when the money is gone, the money is going to be gone. There's not going to be coming back to the well for more money because the money is physically gone. And that's the challenge we have right now. And it doesn't happen in one execution year of the President's budget. It takes us two to three, four years if you're doing local nationals overseas, local national employees, which are not part of the larger pot, you, you cannot eliminate those jobs in 12 months. In most cases, those jobs are eliminated in terms of 700 to 900 day periods. So it's not a one year problem. So we've got to look in the out years and see what we've got to pay legally to get through there. So this is a tremendous challenge for us. But certainly the civilian workforce has to come down just like the active component is going to come down so we can balance the readiness for structure modernization needs of the Army. Thanks, Howard. Good. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, Howard, yeah. I hear all of that. What do you, your borrowed military manpower is going up. You yes, know, sir. Somebody's running the ASP. Yes, I sir. mean, somebody's running the gate at Fort Bragg. At the places I go, I, I see paratroopers on the gate. I mean, we're, we're starting to go back into the old model where the money isn't there for civilians, so the uniform guys and gals are doing it. Apropos job, job satisfaction. Job satisfaction starts to wane, other than the Ranger Regiment. <clears throat> and, and what does it do to the health of the uh, civilian workforce? Uh, to be in these hiring freezes for two years. And oh, by the way, if you're not commissioning in cadet command, what about all these young people who have a propensity for service who might want to come into the civilian workforce if they knew about it? Who's uh, recruiting out of the colleges? I think you've got an untapped uh, source of manpower out there, but I'm, I'm not sure that you have the money to hire them. I think you got a real, uh, not you, we, the Army, the nation has a real challenge here. Yes, sir, if I could follow, just follow two points on, on that. The first one is the, the challenge we also have is what don't we have to do? 
see, so it, it's okay in some regards to have people go to like at Fort Bragg and, and do the gate for so many days and you can fit it into that job description and you can fit it into some, some battle tasks that have to be done anyway. It's not okay to do that indefinitely for that same soldier. I think you have a great point about how do we pull people, younger, younger people into the civilian workforce, untapped resources. And that's why we don't want to get rid of things like the intern programs and other things. The challenge we're going to have to do is work around how to go after and target that. We have to have a different targeting approach to bring people in to do that. And there, because there is a definite long-term effect. But one of the things I, I go back to, my first point, is there has to be a realization of, of what you're not going to do. And that's one thing the leadership is really focused on now. And, a lot, and, and putting things down so people can make a decision, I cannot do that or I can't do it inside of 12 months, it just doesn't happen. You, you, there's just no way to get around it anymore. Uh, because we do very seldom take, take things off the plate, as you know. We continue to add and add and add. It's not, that's not a, a direct answer, but we're very concerned about that. And I think, I think we can get through some of it, but we've got to rationalize it. Okay. Okay, so uh, I've got a good, uh, very good question here on uh, uh, engineering education uh, at the college level. And uh, first and much of the second year engineering is not taught by engineers. Young men and women find it boring and dry. And uh, how, can we, how can we force schools to change that? Um, so I came from a family of civil engineers and uh, I have two sons, um, and, and I told them both, if they went off to college to pursue a liberal arts education, I'd shoot them. Um, <laughs> so my oldest son uh, graduated with a physics degree, and my, my youngest son is in his last year of mechanical engineering. And their education experiences have been uh, very, very different. My oldest son uh, went to a small school, a small college, uh, and the model of education uh, in his department was based on the art of mentoring. Um, and I can see his, his growth over uh, four years and I can see it in him today and what that has done for him and how passionate he, is, he has become, not, not only about uh, his discipline but uh, about life in general. Uh, and my youngest son went through a program like exists in some of the larger schools out there. Uh, it was a education based on attrition. You know, uh, those that survived <clears throat> the first couple of years, then you know they f they figured they got to the uh, the cream of the crop and and then moved on from there. Uh, so I think uh, at, at that level, um, I think this whole business of of mentoring. Is, is really, really important in, uh, in education. I think it makes a difference, as it does uh, in the military and in industry, uh, wh wherever it is. Uh, and so uh, I would say that the, that's one of the ways that we fix it is, is probably uh, highlighting the necessity of this art of mentoring and growing younger educations through, through the art of uh, mentoring. Thanks, Galen. Uh, Maria, as you take your question, uh, maybe you also want to take a shot at a point General Sullivan made. Okay. So the, uh, the question I have is, um, are you seeing a decrease in propensity to take ROTC and sign a contract to serve? If so, can the Army, what can the Army do about it? Um, from what we're seeing uh, within ROTC, we're seeing a pretty steady propensity to take ROTC and actually sign the contract to serve. Um, over the last few years, we've been enjoyed a, um, a very good rate of meeting our mission and actually exceeding our mission. And our future projections show us on glide path to meet the mission numbers that have been given to us. So we're, we're seeing, still seeing the same uh, level of propensity to take ROTC. Now that propensity, a couple of things we found out about it though is that the propensity is more if somebody knows somebody in the military or has some type of military connection, so it's coming more from military-type families. We're, what we're not reaching out to are those that really don't have a good sense of what the military is. And so what we find is that there is an overall general lack of understanding of what does it mean to truly be an officer in the United States Army, what are the opportunities available 
in the Army? And then more importantly, how, how can you come into the Army and also achieve your goals and your career path that you wanted to do? Um, and so that's part of what we see as I'm out there talking to, this is from educators, from parents, um, from, from, from everybody. So really we have to, as I look at it, our, we have to really get out and make sure everybody understands what officership is. And then more importantly, what are the opportunities available in the Army? I mean, it, you can talk to them and they'll, their, inf, their mental image of the Army is, you know, the infantryman or the armor uh, picture and, and going to war and, and that's it. We have to kind of erase that image to show them that we're much more than that and there is greater opportunities available within the Army. The other thing we find is that the populations that aren't, uh, don't understand the Army very well also don't understand the financial incentives of just ROTC and then the follow-on service in the Army. And that's just not the, the young um, students. These are the influencers that are out there too, the educators. And so as we were, I was just listening to the discussion here about the engineering and it being boring. You know, part of our challenge with getting um, engineers to support our engineer degree requirement field the fact is a lot of deans that are out there in these colleges and universities don't understand what can be done within the army you know um, in terms of having an engineering degree and applying those skill sets both from just a army perspective military and a civilian perspective they just don't understand so we are increasing our ability to uh, reach these influencers and gain that understanding. Um, so on General Sullivan's question, I think there is a great opportunity as we're out there and that was kind of the, the last um, part that I talked about, that, that piece about partnering with industry but not just partnering with industry from a military perspective when we have an ROTC cadet. But I think that if we can educate within the colleges and universities these civilian opportunities that are available to, that support our Army. Um, the good one I always use when I'm talking to college presidents are, you know, we, yes, you have an engineering department, but we also have labs out there. We have the Corps of Engineers. We have civilians that support the Army, and these are the things that you can do. We just got to get into the right markets, the right events, so that we can educate and show the influencers and the students what's available. Thanks, Maria. Yes, sir. In fact, um, very, very good point, sir, because, you know, as part, when they're going through our ROTC program and whether they decide to join or not, part of what we do is we open up um, summer internship programs to them, and we actually have internship programs with the FBI, CIA, and other agencies, Corps of Engineers, so that we can, we can expose them to that. And whether they sign the contract or not or come in and support the military, they know that that, that is out there for them. You have to be careful, though, that you don't, uh, with some of your programs, like this two, two summers at summer camp, you, you have some of these students who will become good officers who are paying their own way. They're paying their own way. And when you take a summer employment away from them, you're, uh, that's the downside of that two summers that I see, because they're using that money to uh, get through school. And you don't want to, we don't want to be accused of increasing college debt so that we can give them what they can get in uh, OBC or. Yes, sir. Good. And we've actually taken that into consideration in terms of um, the incentives that we offer. And we're also, um, as we're out there engaging with the, the current cadets and the future uh, population of uh, potential recruits, we're, we are talking to them about that to ensure that we actually don't um, inadvertently create a situation where it we lose some momentum on getting an officer but then also increase the burden on that officer. Actually the cadets that we talk to, they are actually looking forward to this and they as the right incentive is in place, they want to do this. And we also think that it's going to provide an opportunity because we have several 
we have cadets that come through the program and are on contract and then decide that they don't want to do it. I think this is a good way that um, they can determine, is this for me or not? Because what we find with our leader training course that we send cadets to right now, once they come to it, they figure out that this is what they want to do. They love it that much, and we have a high percentage of those that we contract. So they end up kind of giving up too, but sir, we're very sensitive to that. Okay, thanks Maria, Bill. Yes, sir, I have several questions. I'll, I'll hit the first one, and then if there's time to circle back. Uh, the question is, do we need to consider new, even unorthodox recruiting methods for the more technological piece of the Army, S&T, R&D, et cetera? Short answer is, is of course, yes, we do. Uh, a, a greater issue is, and, and I'm sure many of you have read in a, in a recent federal employee uh, survey for best places to work that the Army finished next to last in that survey. So we need to, again, through marketing, through getting out there and outreach, uh, convince those those employees that we want, the younger generation, that the Army is an employer of, of choice. Uh, we are not under a hiring freeze as we were in 13, but we are under strict hiring controls as long as we are held to the TDA vice being able to manage to the budget, as we've discussed, as General Bromberg uh, put it so well. Um, so in, in the marketing piece, and I saw a recent commercial in the last week, uh, drill sergeant, um, talking to soldiers and what do you want to do, armor, armor, infantry, and then one kid says, I want to be a graphic artist. And, and so it's getting the word out that, that it's, there's plenty of great opportunities for young kids, both coming in the Army as soldiers and for civilians. The Army is much, much more broad and deep than, than what a lot of our, our civilian population knows, knows and thinks. I'd like to see direct hiring authority for critical skills in the science and technology and R&D areas. We don't have that. We can typically get expedited hiring authority, but you still go through the same, basically the same process. You save very little time. Um, I'd like to see more outreach. Uh, last year, because of budgetary reasons, we were not allowed to send Dale Warman and some of his folks out to the, the right kind of hiring fairs. We were limited in travel. Now that's open a little bit. But again, we have to have the vacancies to be able to do that. To get some of the vacancies, we need to enhance the Vera VSIP that's offered right now. I didn't mention that in the earlier remarks, but we have to kind of start stirring this pot somewhere. And right now, the Vera VSIP authorities we have, while we are greatly appreciate those, $25,000 after taxes does not incentivize our more senior workforce to leave to create those vacancies so we can bring in those critical skills that we need. I propose either doubling that and uh, or using uh, some other method to allow people to if they get out the first quarter of the year they get credit for that entire year of service to increase their retirement there's a lot of holes in all this understand but we have to think in, in those kind of terms we also have to think about how we go about hiring people frankly we're stuck in 20th century processes where somebody puts in their resume if the number if the letters match or the words match they make the final cut and then you have to talk to them, and you don't know if they're going to fit in or not. Google has, a, has quite a different approach to this, and they use metadata, and I realize there's some issues with that, but when somebody applies to them, they send them a couple of apps. They're connected with a company called Knack, and these folks play these games, believe it or not. These young folks play these games, and that allows Google to determine behavioral characteristics, how people are going to fit in an organization, what their value to the organization might be. Perhaps we need to look at something, something along those lines. And then lastly, we do have several programs that we greatly appreciate uh, that are providing us the opportunity to bring in these young kids. The intern program that was mentioned, um, but unfortunately that program was cut in half from 2,000 to 1,000 for budgetary reasons. So there's only 1,000 interns in the system at any one time. Uh, we have uh, NDAA money that's called 852 money that allows us to bring on folks out of a centrally funded pot for two years or three years in some cases. And Army Contracted Command is a great user of this, bringing on kids that can be 1102s, and then as vacancies are created, we can place those folks. But again, that's a key. We have to create these vacancies by providing opportunities for our folks to be more agile and move, and move on. Um, lastly, there's the Pathways Program, which is uh, an administrative, uh, our administration's initiative, which allows us to bring kids on again right out of college within two years of graduation in certain critical skills uh, as a direct hiring option. And it also applies to our soldiers that are within six years of, of getting out. So many of, those, um, many of those opportunities are there. There's some things we're going to have to think about radically different to bring in these kids. 
but I, I, the key is to create those vacancies and um, to be able to manage to the budget, vice to the TDA, which frankly is going to force us to reduce significant numbers of our S&T community if we have to go that route. Thanks, Bill. And Sergeant Major, I know you got a stack of questions down there, <laughs> and I got more for you here. But just uh, absolutely, and take I'm gonna, one. I'm going to take the liberty to answer all of them. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> But I did, and I do apologize if I do not get to answer your question, and I, I will stay after as long as I need to, to to do so. But I tried to pick the one that was uh, consistent across all, all, all the several I have here. But the question for me was, by what means can we influence uh, early education to, to produce better recruits? And I think that's a phenomenal question, and it's something I touched on. Um, I think this, it, this is much higher than a Department of Defense and a military issue. This is a national issue. Um, and I'll tell you, just to, to give you some perspective on this, is I was looking at a chart the other day, and we do a lot of analysis on our 17 to 24-year-old uh, population, probably more than any other organization in the United States. And uh, it's just hardening to see some of the, the high school graduation rates by state. Um, and I can tell you some of the lowest union, without calling them out, are just over 50%. Hmm. And, and my thought process is that I know that there's people that who are disadvantaged in our nation. And, but I know our nation does very well at providing programs for disadvantaged people. And, uh, but there's no way that 50% of a certain state is disadvantaged. I think that in some regards, our state uh, and maybe even federal laws are, are too lenient on, on allowing people to leave education prior to complete. Um, just uh, years ago, um, you know, it was very stringent. Um, and they, they used to send people to your home. Those are one of the things, problems I had when I was a base arm major in Colorado was um, the police uh, had a very tough time just going to people's homes to get parents to get their children to go to school. I don't know how we correct that, but I think that it's a, it's a national problem that it is on the decline and not the rise, and it's something that we have to address. Um, and I, I think we need to be public about it um, as, as educators I, and, and as a, a people organization, probably one of the largest people organizations in America, um, in the U.S. Uh, military. And I think, you know, we need to use in our campaigns and be very broad and bold about what it takes to be a United States Army soldier, an Air Force or Marine or a sailor. Um, and uh, I think that may hit home with uh, America's youth and at least uh, stimulate some of the, uh, the parents out there who are our number one contact for many of our uh, new recruits. And then the second part of the question was, how can we influence moral and ethical foundations of those uh, recruits before they enlist? Another excellent question. Um, our recruits are just as diverse as the population of America, and simply by design. We want it to be that way. We want to be as close a representation of America as possible. But as I mentioned in, uh, in some of my thoughts was the expectation of the American soldier is higher than ever it was previously in the past history of our nation and our service to our nation. Um, and um, moral, moral and ethical correctness is something that we struggle with every day from some things as simplistic as how many tattoos should a soldier have on their arms and and uh, on their legs is something that's uh, very near and dear to many leaders' hearts. Um, and then, of course, how they, uh, how they act both uh, here in the United States and more importantly when they're in those critical missions and becoming the strategic, strategic privates that they are. I think what we need to do is uh, continue to do what we're doing on our basic training um, and AITs. Unfortunately, a lot of uh, the behavior, and I was explaining this to a, a group of leaders the other day, a lot of behavior that we observe in those uh, environments is not consistent with their normal behavior. When those young men and women come to basic tra training in AIT, they don't display their natural attributes. It's usually those consistent of what they, they think they need to do in order to keep the drill sergeant from yelling at them. <laughs> um, and, and unfortunately, a lot of these come out in their first unit or just shortly after arrival to their first unit. But I think that we have an excellent campaign in the Army today that's getting at it, and it's called the Army Profession. From the Chief of Staff of the Army and the Sergeant Major of the Army, it is clear across all senior leader lines and uh, consistent through subordinate leaders that uh, to be a professional, to aspire as a military professional, it takes competence, competent uh, commitment, um, and uh, you must uh, be able to uh, live the Army values and live up to the expectations, the ever-rising expectations of the American people because the expectation of a U.S. Army soldier is higher than that of the, the average uh, citizen. So I think it's a, it's a challenge that we're going to face. I think it's going gonna, it's gonna to continue to increase in the future, but I think that we have the right met methods, the right focus in place today in the Army, um, and the right campaigns to get at um, maintaining um, the quality force that we need to um, as we move forward in more complex operations.
Thanks, Sergeant Major. Okay, panel, if you can each take one minute and take one more question. We have enough time for that. Okay, I'm going to combine two questions here. It has to do with uh, uh, t actions taken to hire wounded warriors from a policy perspective and tracking veterans and veteran jobs opportunities. Uh, let me just sum this up. I think a big change that in our transitioning of our soldiers is we start 12 months out now by the Veterans Opportunity Work Act, and we have a career-ready standard. I think uh, what this says is so at 12 months, we're asking people to start thinking about their future versus 12 days prior to they get out. And that then we're, we're piling on top of that with Department of Labor and Veterans Affairs support, classes, transition assistance, to include ability to go down to the American Job Centers, start looking for jobs, to include educational opportunities. The two areas that we have to work harder on, we started, we, we really proved our partnership with, is our partnership with the Veterans Affairs and Department of Labor. This is their core competency. It's not an Army core competency. I'm transitioning people into jobs. We do the services, but the people that have a budget that's not under sequestration and a budget that is not under hiring freezes, the Veterans Affairs, and rightfully so. And that's the piece we need to leverage. And we need to leverage Department of Labor. They have a whole organization that's focused on moving people into there. We might give an ACAP class uh, on a post camper station, but I, I, as I have learned, the Department of Veteran Affairs and the Department of Labor offers private one-on-one -on -one scheduled counseling sessions for career readiness. We give them a career counselor. It's a benefit people don't use or they don't even know about until it's too far down the path. So we're trying to push things back to the left and there's, there's a, I could go on for hours about the types of programs that are out there from U.S. pipe fitters to the job coalition that is going after 100,000 jobs for veterans and soldiers for wounded warrior actions. But I think there is, there is plenty of movement that is still in this area taking care of soldiers and sailors and airmen as they transition. And there's, and again, it could be a whole other block of instruction or a class that would be a day and a half long. And the amount of money that is out there inside the Veterans Affairs and Department of Labor uh, is, is pretty impressive when you look at their capability. Uh, and that's, the, that's what we're trying to do is connect those soldiers with, with uh, employers earlier through Veterans Affairs and Department of Labor. Thanks, Howard. Galen? Uh, so uh, can, uh, can you give a brief description of Raytheon Company's uh, mentor program? Um, well, let me address it this way. Uh, I think um, it's important to recognize that uh, uh, mentorship uh, and the art of mentorship is one of those things that we should expect that our mid-level leaders and our executive level leaders uh, to have as a core competency. So it is a, it's something that ought to be happening all the time out there. So it starts with an expectation that that is part of the core competency of, uh, of our leaders. Uh, the other point that I would make here is that uh, aside from what uh, a mentorship program, we do have a leader development program within Raytheon where in our emerging pool of talent, the mid and executive level leaders identify what we consider to be talent that can be accelerated and we, we move them into a leadership development program uh, where they spend, spend a year uh, not only at the experiential uh, levels but moving and being exposed to executive uh, leaders uh, mid-level leaders, et cetera, kind of across the enterprise. Uh, and then they have a follow-on assignment, and then, you know, they're kind of uh, managed uh, then throughout the rest of uh, their career where they can find opportunities to accelerate uh, them given their uh, potentials out there. Uh, and that happens in all of uh, our, uh, we have four major disciplines, uh, strategic pipelines, we, we call them, uh, and we have a program for each one of those pipelines, uh, and, it, and it gives us the opportunity, again, to excel uh, people uh, into higher levels of, uh, of responsibility out there. And a key component of that leader development is uh, mentorship uh, throughout at various levels. Thanks, Galen. Maria. Are, are we tracking the junior ROTC program? And do we know the number of students that are enlisting or going into college? Um, yes, we are tracking the junior ROTC program. Cadet Command oversees uh, this program. There's about 1,700 plus uh, junior ROTC programs with about 300,000 cadets currently enrolled. 
The focus of this program, however, is, is squarely on producing better citizens, um, improving their leadership skills, and then also preparing them uh, for college. I've seen the numbers between 20 to 30 percent that actually either enlist or go on and take junior ROTC in, in or take senior ROTC in college. So it's somewhere between that. Um, but yes, we are tracking it. Thanks, Maria. Bill, one minute. Yes, sir, one minute. Uh, basically, what are we doing to avoid experiencing a decade of new outside hires like we experienced in the 90s so we don't have a civilian hollow force? Um, there's two ways to look at sequestration. Uh, it, it is a terrible, terrible thing, or it's an opportunity for us to change our processes and procedures and build more agility into our civilian workforce. And that's what we intend to do. That's what the, uh, the civilian and military leadership at DA and with the ACOMs and all the way on down are trying to do. New hiring process. Continue the outreach to those critical skill sets we need, those students that are graduating. Uh, enhance Vera Visa so we can encourage some of our more senior folks who are ready to retire to retire to create those vacancies. And lastly, as we've, we've hit on a few times, is uh, manage appropriately towards the budget that we have, vice TDA, which may be an artificial construct based on a concept plan that could be 10 or 12 years old. Yeah. Sir? Thanks, Bill. And Sergeant Major, take us home. Yes, sir. Uh, I actually picked this question because I know it's near and dear to a lot of soldiers and families' hearts and veterans as well right now. But the question over the past 20 years, we've transitioned from an army of soldiers who enlisted to serve their country um, for, to an army of soldiers who serve for benefits. And this day, when our organization, our congressional leaders, uh, pursue measures to strip the army of veterans and, and their benefits, uh, what initiatives are leaders looking at to persuade young people to make the army a career besides education? Uh, retention bonuses and etc. That, that is a phenomenal question and I'll tell you I think uh, the first thing I do when I talk to soldiers I tell them our nation is at war and it will continue to be at war as it has in a post-war era consistently throughout our history for, for the next several years and just like the responsibility that we gave our soldiers to win the last war this, that we did in the last 12 years it's our job uh, to help them win a financial war. Now that doesn't mean that uh, I'm an advocate of, of stripping benefits, but I do ask soldiers to be weary of what you ask for, as well as family members. Because when you ask for those things, it can erode at your benefits. So I think in some regards, soldiers are okay right now with um, the level of what they, the pay they receive and the care. And we've given our families a tremendous amount. The taxpayers of the United States of America have been completely generous to the things that they gave us during, uh, to support us during the war effort. I think it's important to, to let them know that, uh, to be aware of the fact that when they ask for something, it may, it may cause an erosion of uh, the veterans, not only, I mean, uh, benefits not only now, but uh, veterans' benefits as well. Um, and then lastly, just to close that, I'd, I'd say that uh, we have to do a better job of giving our soldiers credit for what they do. It's something we have not done well throughout our history. Um, it's something that uh, we can easily achieve with, uh, um, with help from state and uh, federal government uh, partnerships. I think that uh, we give our soldiers a tremendous amount of skill, um, but we just don't give them credit for it. But I can tell you that we're working with uh, not only uh, federal and state uh, agencies, but also industry to help them recognize that the uh, knowledge, skills, and attributes that a soldier learned in the United States Army uh, are not just consistent with winning wars overseas, but could be consistent with the things that need to be to accomplish to rebuild this nation and put it back as one of the uh, science and technology leaders in the world. Sir, that's all I have. Hey, thanks, sir.